So the rest of this was uh, that um, uh, there may be some decreased air entry uh, or tympani and percussion if uh, there is a large amount of pneumothorax. So on that side of the lung, you will see that uh, or you will notice that there is some tympani because of excessive air. Uh, chest x-ray is going to be the diagnostic test of choice. So you will do the x-ray and of course very quickly you will find out that patient has pneumothorax. So this is a chest x-ray you've already seen it. So there is a lot of uh, there's a huge amount of pneumothorax here. Lung is collapsed. Here is a CT scan and right-sided uh, lung is uh, basically collapsed. And the next is a pneumonia or bronchitis. So patients with pneumonia can also present with chest pain. Although the most common chief complaint with pneumonia uh, usually is fever um, and shortness of breath and cough and phlegm. And patients with bronchitis usually present with cough and phlegm only. They don't have as much fever or shortness of breath. So, but however, if uh, chest pain is present with cough, then we should think about pneumonia too. Um, this is going to occur more commonly in older patients who don't have typical textbook presentations. So therefore, uh, a good idea to keep in mind. So what kind of chest, uh, what kind of cough they have? They have productive cough. On top of that, they have green phlegm. Um, they may have some shortness of breath. And usually they don't complain about using inhalers in the past. They don't have a history of asthma if it is a standalone pneumonia. But also keep in mind that patients with asthma or COPD can develop superimposed pneumonia. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, risk factors again, older, very older and very younger age groups, so your children, your infants, your neonates, and your nursing home patients. All of them are at especially high risk for developing pneumonia. Smoking is definitely a risk factor, uh, especially for bronchitis. Usually patients who are heavy smokers uh, get a couple of uh, episodes a year uh, with bronchitis, so something to keep in mind. Uh, contact, uh, if you've been exposed to somebody who already has uh, bronchitis, uh, you can get pneumonia or bronchitis, and recent upper respiratory infection will place a person at risk for uh, developing pneumonia. So, for example, a viral infection can particularly uh, place a person at risk for uh, staph pneumonia. Exam findings again would be vital signs will be a little bit odd uh, or off, so you may see some tachypnea, tachycardia, and hypoxia. And if these are present, then these are red flag situations. So you may want to go ahead and start oxygen and then uh, and intervene before you um, uh, do the rest of the evaluation. Uh, and they also may have wrong eye on chest auscultation. And if it is low bar consolidation, uh, then you will see that there is some dullness to percussion. The diagnostic test of choice would be chest x-ray and CBC. So uh, blood count will be high, I mean white count will be high, there may be left-sided shift especially in very young and very old patients. Chest x-ray will show some consolidation. CBC will be helpful not only to make the diagnosis but also to monitor treatment response. So if somebody started antibiotics and they are not getting better and you're doing the CBC, your, your white count will show if they are getting better or not. So this is a slide showing uh, uh, pneumonia on the right side and there is another low bar consolidation on the right side. The next is lung abscess or lung cancer. So we covered this already in dyspnea, but quickly going over this again. Uh, patients with chest pain and fever uh, should be thought of as having lung abscess. Uh, usually this is shorter duration, so it's less than four weeks. Uh, so uh, one um, possibility will be pneumonia, but then also if patients are not getting better, you may, uh, may want to suspect that patient now maybe has developed abscess, which is a very common complication of uh, pneumonia or untreated pneumonia. Then patients who have chest pain and weight loss, then uh, definitely, and some cough, definitely we should think about lung cancer. So they usually have chronic symptoms and they are usually more than four to eight weeks. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So the differentiating features between these two is uh, duration and presence of fever and presence of weight loss. Then uh, usually they develop progressive dyspnea, both of them, and then uh, patients can develop some hemoptysis, especially lung cancer patients. They have cough and weight loss. Uh, and then on physical exam, they have variable lung exam. And they may some have some extra pulmonary manifestations of lung cancer. So for example, they may develop Horner syndrome or some other uh, symptoms of um, uh, or perineoplastic features. 
and then uh, when you do their chest x-ray you may see a mass uh, but if it is small then you can do a CT scan and it will clearly give you uh, an idea risk factors for lung cancer would be again very similar to multiple uh, risk factors for multiple other cancers in the body so smoking is a big risk factor uh, older age and then family history so of course always advise your patient on this uh, risk factors for lung abscess would be uh, these so recent lung infection untreated lung infection patients who are alcoholics and they've aspirated uh, because um, uh, some of the gastric content because of alcoholism uh, and then some neurological dysfunction so anybody who cannot handle their secretions are uh, at risk for developing lung abscess and usually this is going to be anaerobes so obviously you're going to have to treat them accordingly with proper antibiotics and i think we covered all of this in fever so next is your patient uh, this is a slide with uh, lung abscess on the left side you can see a pretty good air bronchogram and then here is a slide with um, lung cancer so very irregular mass on the left side so it is a cancer and then here's a nodule this is uh, going to turn out to become a cancer and here is another very irregular nodule uh, in the on the ct scan and it is malignant all right so now we moved on from um, the pulmonary and cardiac causes of chest pain to extra pulmonary and cardiac causes so now we'll talk about musculoskeletal causes so costochondritis is an extremely common cause of chest pain so uh, about 40 percent of patients who have chest pain have costochondritis or muscular strain that is causing chest pain so keep that in mind so how do they present the biggest thing uh, classic feature would be reproducible chest pain so that is something to keep in mind uh, these patients usually have localized pain that lasts for hours and days so it's not just a few minutes or a few hours but it's usually several hours and uh, even a few days uh, this is a very positional chest pain so uh, patients may say that when they lay down a certain way that's when they have the pain or when they bend over or reach over to do something that's when they have more pain and usually there is uh, a history of either overuse if not trauma so this will be present if you probe the patient a little bit more you will um, get this story too and when you do the exam the pain is going to be worse with chest wall palpation so that is something to keep in mind um, if the patient has had severe trauma uh, and they've fractured a rib then on exam they will have flail chest but then this is not costochondritis anymore this is flail chest so this is an entirely different thing where now patient is extremely short of breath and you have to intervene so this is a different uh, on a regular costochondritis or musculoskeletal cause of chest pain you will just have a simple trauma and some reproducible chest pain also you will see that they have absence of cardiovascular risk factors so usually uh, when a patient has uh, this typical chest pain and no risk factors you can basically send them home they don't need to be evaluated further but also keep in mind that uh, patients who even have cardiovascular risk factors which uh, vast majority of our adult population older than 50 has some cardiovascular risk factors they can also get some trauma and overuse injury and hence develop costochondritis so you want to keep that in mind too but your uh, index of suspicion uh, for cardiac cause of ischemia will be a little bit higher in that population as opposed to your younger uh, risk factor free population who has reproducible chest pain so for example your young patient um, who has no risk factor um, comes in with reproducible chest pain you don't even need to do an EKG on that patient uh, it will really not yield anything but uh, if you do it it will be normal so next is um, gastrointestinal causes of chest pain so first of those is uh, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease it's a fairly common cause of chest pain usually it is postprandial chest pain so it happens after people have eaten their big meal and they've laid down usually so it is going to be your burning pain usually center of the chest usually accompanied by some regurgitation so very classic and patients can usually tell you that they know it is reflux uh, it gets better when they get up or stand up or sit up so it's going to be worse with lying down it is usually uh, relieved by tums but the food can have positive or negative effect on it so just keep that in mind but tums will usually relieve it 
and uh, spicy foods alcohol fatty food will exacerbate it too then risk factors are going to be obesity so your overweight patients your patients who drink alcohol very heavily patients who smoke heavily on high fat diet patients who drink a lot of coffee uh, are going to be definitely at risk so this looks like half of our population but h pylori is another risk factor so this is your uh, microorganism that can cause uh, reflux and ulcer and then hiatal hernia usually which is more common in obese patients will secondarily cause some GERD on physical exam your cardiovascular exam will be totally normal of course in this case you may see some epigastric tenderness so if that is present then usually it supports the diagnosis um, so therefore uh, you can uh, do this part of the exam a diagnostic test uh, would be uh, basically you don't need to do any test in the beginning so if the patient just barely started with symptoms you can do lifestyle modification with treatment you don't have to really do endoscopy but if the symptoms have persisted for quite some time and or if they are not responding to treatment then you can do gastric pH study or you can do upper uh, endoscopy that will uh, give you some clear picture and treatment of course lifestyle modification is the hallmark of the treatment uh, definitely this needs to be done uh, i'm sorry about the typo here but h2 blockers and your proton pump inhibitors those are the uh, medications that can be used h pylori treatment will be needed so uh, if you have diagnosed this you definitely need to treat it uh, and then surgery is the last resort if medical treatment fails and then also another important thing to keep in mind is that patients who have chronic GERD they can go on to develop complications and the biggest complication or the most serious complication is going to be Barrett's esophagus so Barrett's esophagus is basically uh, a situation where because of repetitive insult by acid they have uh, now transitioned from squamous cell epithelium to metaplastic columnar epithelium so lower end of the esophagus will turn into uh, metaplastic columnar epithelium and this is precancerous or pre-malignant so keep this in mind it's very important to remember this then the next is diffuse esophageal spasm so this is uh, basically a situation where patient have um, just a spasm of the esophagus it's very diffuse it causes very severe chest pain so it's usually more severe than a regular GERD and this happens uh, after a few seconds after they have eaten so patients will go ahead and start eating so they don't have dysphagia necessarily at the onset so the pain doesn't start simultaneously with eating but it starts after a few seconds of uh, having eaten so uh, that is the distinction and these patients have usually very squeezing uh, tight uh, severe chest pain and they can develop dysphagia later on after this has set in but the onset of the pain will be several seconds after the uh, meal and risk factors for diffuse esophageal spasm again will be very similar to your uh, GERD risk factors but then uh, your cardiovascular exam again will be very normal and uh, if you do uh, the diagnostic test of choice if you are suspecting this would be barium swallow because barium swallow will show uh, corkscrew uh, esophagus that we'll see here in a second here and then also you can uh, monitor or check the pressure of the esophagus which is done through esophageal manometry and this is how you know this is des treatment of choice would be calcium channel blockers and then of course surgery would be the ras resort so here is an important phenomena to keep in mind so what kind of patients can develop diffuse esophageal spasm well in addition to risk factors there are special category of patients that can develop it so these are going to be your patients with scleroderma or systemic sclerosis so scleroderma is a very uh, special uh, disease uh, that gives rise to a constellation of symptoms it's a con connected tissue disorder where you have basically crest so crest stands for calcinosis uh, Raynard uh, phenomena where there is extreme um, bluish discoloration of uh, extremities then there is esophageal spasm which presents like this then there is uh, of course systemic sclerosis and there is telangiectasias on the skin so there are skin findings there are uh, extremity findings there is esophageal finding and there is uh, calcinosis of the skin so that's how you can um, um, 
if you suspect somebody with these findings and you see that they have uh, diffuse esophageal spasm then you can uh, figure out that the patient has scleroderma and you can run special tests um, here is a barium swallow showing corkscrew esophagus so you can see there is a lot of uh, it's a pretty cool picture uh, it just looks very painful just to look at it but these are uh, esophageal spastic um, uh, basically uh, activities as you can see here on the slide so uh, barium will show like this there's a lot of spasm at multiple segments so the last of the uh, gastrointestinal causes of chest pain is going to be esophageal tear so uh, this can happen in an acute setting so this patient will come in very acutely they usually have pain uh, within a few minutes they will show up so it can be mallory weiss tear or be harp syndrome both of these are basically esophageal tears and the only difference is mallory weiss tear is usually after uh, a huge amount of alcohol intake so these patients start to vomit because of alcohol and now they develop mallory weiss tear on the other hand bihar uh, syndrome is going to be where patients just have uh, vomiting for whatever reason and then eventually uh, they uh, retch a lot and that's when they tear their esoph esophagus so again this tear is going to be mucosal tear so it's not through and through tear uh, the pain is usually because of mucosal uh, disruption so chest pain is going to be there it's going to be severe along with that it will be and there will be some vomiting that usually precedes the chest pain in both of these situations and there is some blood again these patients will usually present with uh, upper gi bleed as a chief complaint and not necessarily chest pain as a chief complaint but chest pain may become their secondary complaint. So risk factors again, uh, like I said, alcohol is a big risk factor for mallory weiss tear. There may be um, also hiatal hernia is a risk factor. Older age is a risk factor too. Bihar syndrome, patients usually uh, risk factor is going to be uh, emesis, a lot of vomiting, and the hematemesis. So very uh, exactly the same thing that I said here. Complications again, so if these patients have bled a lot, uh, upper GI bleed, remember, is usually much more serious than lower GI bleed because not only patient is hemorrhaging and losing blood, but also they are at very high risk for aspiration and upper airway obstruction. So they can, uh, the fatality and mortality are much higher with upper GI bleed. So you must definitely pay attention to it and this should be taken very seriously. So the complications can be either because of the airway obstruction, which is very serious, or because of massive blood loss, these people can develop hemorrhagic shock and now the situation changes altogether. So then you need to start managing that. Here is a, 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 an esophagus, so you can see there's a tear here. So uh, this is just another quick um, review of what are the alarm symptoms for GERD or gastro gastroesophageal reflux disease. So uh, the gastroesophageal reflux disease patients who continue to have symptoms for a long time um, there are some alarm symptoms that go along with it, uh, in which case you must definitely do um, endoscopy and make sure there is no malignant lesion. Um, so what are those? So patients usually have a start to have weight loss, they may have recurrent vomiting, they start to have some dysphagia, uh, anemia and coffee ground emesis. So these are just alarm symptoms. Uh, they may also have daily symptoms, but that is not counted as alarm symptom. So these patients basically will, uh, the story will go like this. They will say they have not only reflux, but they also have recurrent vomiting. It happens pretty much every day. They have, uh, I mean, the vomiting happens every day. They will say the vomiting is now turning into blood uh, or coffee ground color. They are now starting to develop some dysphagia because of this. And they are also starting to lose some weight. And when you do their labs, they have anemia. So these are the alarm symptoms. Very important to keep in mind these patients will need to be scoped uh, fairly quickly. All right, so the next uh, section or the next category uh, of diseases uh, is from dermatological area or dermatology. So you have dermatological causes of uh, chest pain and, and there is only one, so that is herpes zoster or shingles. It's a very commonly known problem. So people come in with shingles, they usually have vesicles in a dermatome distribution. And if they happen, this dermatome happens to be left side of the chest, then you can say this is causing chest pain. So usually people have pre-herpetic pain, herpetic pain, and then post-herpetic pain. So there is pain all over. So this is what happens. There is burning pain. So this is not your typical 
dull or reproducible or uh, uh, pressure or squeeze like pain this is burning pain in the distribution of dermatome uh, and again preherpetic and postherpetic pain and there is some neuropathy risk factors again uh, so unfortunately older people will get it immunocompromised patients can get it so people who have diabetes they can get it too people with HIV people with uh, immunosuppressive treatment all of them can get herpes zoster infection and the treatment is going to be acyclovir for the zoster itself um, the neurontin can be given or gabapentin can be given for neuropathic pain and then we can also do preventative uh, treatment so zoster vaccine or shigella vaccine can be given to patients uh, to prevent it here's a slide showing a very dermatomal distribution of herpetic vesicles so you can see the patient has vesicles in the distribution of uh, dermatome on the left side of the chest extending to the back uh, so therefore the patient will have pain in this area so the last one uh, uh, or last category uh, of causes of chest pain is uh, psychological uh, causes so that is your anxiety and anxiety or panic disorder will definitely cause chest pain uh, very classic chest pain so usually these people have chest pain and a lot of symptoms so what are those uh, uh, well before we talk about it it is important to keep in mind that this is going to be your diagnosis of exclusion so very very important to keep that in mind do not uh, label anybody with anxiety even if they show like they have classic anxiety uh, until you have excluded with the uh, with other things so you got to take a proper history for this so for example um, these patients are going to have these symptoms so chest pain shortness of breath palpitations numbness and tingling whenever they have this uh, double sandwich of symptoms present uh, shortness of breath and palpitations with chest pain chest pain right here and numbness and tingling then maybe it is anxiety in the absence of cardiac risk factors uh, so your uh, a proper history asking questions about chest pain itself and then all these things will uh, make you think that this is maybe anxiety risk factors previous history of panic attacks uh, post-traumatic stress disorder depressive illness female patients and this age category so these are the risk factors but again like i said this should be a diagnosis of exclusion so these people will hyperventilate um, and that is one physical exam finding so you will see that they are hyperventilating instead of being short of breath or instead of um, showing any other findings they are hyperventilating they have totally normal oxygen saturation and in some si situations there are some studies that have found that mitral valve prolapse uh, can be a concomitant finding so you may hear a murmur of mitral valve prolapse uh, if you hear it and they also have anxiety disorder they usually go along together but it doesn't again mean that anybody with mitral valve prolapse uh, who comes in with chest pain we should say that this is anxiety so that is something to keep in mind this is just a coincidental finding so that we know that people with MVP uh, are at higher risk for anxiety so just keep that in mind um, again if you do their ABGs which uh, you may not need to do this but if you do you will see low uh, carbon dioxide levels and then lastly um, another very uh, classic and pathologic uh, disorder that can present with exactly the same symptoms shortness of breath palpitations and numbness and tingling with very very high blood pressure would be pheochromocytoma so you must uh, think about this also if you are evaluating a patient with anxiety so usually pheochromocytoma patients will present with very high blood pressures very high um, heart rates shortness of breath palpitations uh, and a lot of anxiety and this is usually very episodic so they don't necessarily have a history of anxiety disorder but they just have an episodic um, uh, a group of symptoms uh, they just present with all of this it goes away when they are they get over the attack but then uh, they get it again so if you evaluate them and do further testing you will find out that they have pheochromocytoma but this is not very common so in general population of course anxiety will be more common treatment for anxiety so panic disorders or anxiety disorder in patients who also have mitral valve prolapse uh, of course in addition to behavior therapy and SSRIs we can give them beta blockers with them because that will control the heart rate to some extent